That's too old. That's too old. Thank you so much, Antonia, and Josephine for facilitating my presence here tonight and the whole ATW team who I know get behind these particular events. And thank you uh, for being here this evening for, I suppose, half an hour, 40 minutes of reflection on some artists that I have had the great pleasure of working with or with whose work I have had a long and close association. Uh, and uh, a reflection on some of the ways in which their work uh, has privileged, uh, reclaimed and renewed uh, textiles as a medium, but through the filter of personal experience, memory, uh, and above all, a conceptual approach to the use of textiles, because there are many people many artists, many practitioners across different disciplines who use textiles. And I could have selected another half dozen uh, on top of the selection I have this evening, but I have zeroed in on a group of artists uh, whose work is very conceptual, conceptually very rich uh, and who I hope you will see uh, connections between. Um, as speculative as they might be, no matter how big the conceptual leap might be, but they are there. Uh, I'm not going to slavishly read from notes, but I do have a few points that I'd like to make about each of these artists. Uh, and some of them are, are pertinent to this particular <laughs> workshop uh, and uh, to tapestry and textiles generally. So let's just start. I. I Whenever you're asked to make a talk, they, they, <laughs> the host organisation loves a title. Um, and uh, homespun material memories just seem to encapsulate in three key terms so much of what each of these artists deals with. Uh, and uh, it's been my great privilege as a curator uh, in the field, particularly in the field of contemporary art, to have worked alongside artists as they are making their work. There is no particular direction. As I said many years ago in an essay, there is no compass with contemporary art. You are in the field with artists and there's no particular direction you're about to follow. You just go with the flow. That's an enormous privilege. Uh, and it's been wonderful over the past 25 years to have watched the evolution of certain artists' careers. So this is a, a combination of venerable, late, iconic figures and emerging iconic figures. So I thought I'd kick off with Louise Bourgeois, who has been an enormously influential artist in my personal life and in my professional life, having had the opportunity to curate two exhibitions of her works, one in 1995 at the NGV and one in 2012 while I was the director at Heidi. And in a career that spanned seven decades, Louise created an oeuvre that is arguably unparalleled uh, in its material and stylistic diversity. And it continues to resist categorization within any specific aesthetic tendency. And what I'm going to concentrate on here is some late works that continued her preoccupation with autobiographical subjects and complex self-portraiture. And in the final years of her life, she gave these particular themes poignant new material form. Her famous saying, art is a guarantee of sanity, uh, preoccupied her throughout her life. And on the right, we see one of several renditions of her famous form, Spiral Woman, either being cocooned or coming out of the spiral, um, she often said, um, to unravel a torment, you have to start somewhere, um, enclosed within one of her famous cells. We'll see more of her work. Louise's fabric sculptures and fabric drawings, as we'll see, uh, made during the last 15 years of her life, recycled and reconstructed her clothing and her vast collection of textiles. And these intensified her work's expression of the human body and of life's episodes. For her, those as daughter, wife, mother, woman, and artist. 
She often recalled in her work the nurture and in her statements, her generous statements, she often recalled the nurturing, repairing, fortifying and protective tendencies of her mother, which she aligned with the processes of stitching and assembling in her late works. And here we have a work from 1997 called Maman, Mother, <coughs> um, one of her famous vast spiders of which there are enormous families hovering over a cell. Uh, but the tapestry fragments uh, will be important to what, comes, uh, what I'm about to say next. Louise's parents, Louis and Josephine Bourgeois, ran a tapestry gallery near their home on the Boulevard Saint-Germain in Paris. Bourgeois' mother and grandmother had been raised in Aubusson, the southern French town settled in the 16th century by tapestry makers from Northern Europe because the level of tannin in the water in the Creuse River made woolen tapestries washed in it especially receptive to, nat receptive to natural dyes. Tapestry making was the family tradition and it was its business. Bourgeoise's grandmother established her own commercial studio making tapestries and passed this labour intensive skills of production and repair onto her daughter, Josephine. Josephine would eventually specialise in the repair of pre-1830 Aubusson tapestries, favouring their woolen medium in contrast to later cotton weaves for which chemical dyes were required. And so part of Louise's vast collection of textiles were fragments from her parents' tapestry workshop that she began to employ and deploy in uh, the service of her art and particularly her cells. So we were delighted when we had the opportunity to bring this particular work to Heidi and some of you who saw that exhibition may remember it. And by the age of 12, Louise Bourgeois herself was sketching feet and other missing elements for cartoons that guided the reweaving of fragments within ruined historical tapestries. Louise said, the subject of pain is the business I am in to give meaning and shape to frustration and suffering. What happens to the body has to be given a formal aspect. So female subjectivity, sexuality, expressed through the body are overt considerations in Louise's late work, of which we see several examples here. As she said, the fears of the past were connected with the functions of the body. They reappear through the body, and for me, sculpture is the body, and my body is my sculpture. So there was a strongly figurative element through much of her work, but then when it was abstracted, it was abstracted in dialogue with some of the essential material forms of her mother's and her grandmother's craft and the particular medium that she would use. So the cotton spools, um, the abstracted pendulous rubber form had a direct relation to the sewn, <coughs> fragmented, strange physiognomies of the heads that really populated many of her late works, particularly hanging, hanging heads with no particular reference to family members, although the trio she often regarded as her children, um, and then uh, the, the more abstract elements of the spools. Around 19... 96, at the age of 85, Bourgeois began to mine her closets for the garments and textiles that she had worn, collected and stored over a lifetime and used them to make sculpture and what she called fabric, fabric drawings. And these continued a lifelong recall and articulation of familial dysfunction, desire and fear, anger and remorse, isolation and connectedness. She regarded these as her eternal themes. And in these late works, they were reiterated in degrees of figuration and abstraction, as I just suggested, to define and redefine an intensely personal narrative. At the end of her life, by weaving, stitching and sewing, she threaded the past through the present and enacted a, pro and enacted a process of repair and reconstruction. Blue Days, on the left, on the right, left, I can't see. <laughs> Blue Days is one of a number of works in which Louise suspended, stuffed and shaped her dresses and shirts, sometimes adding abstract sculptural elements like the red glass sphere 
that here operates like something of a nucleus around which the new sculptural bodies circulate. With its intimate relation to the skin and contours of the body, to time and seasons, clothing was used by Louise for its power to summon memory. As she said, you can retell your life by the shape, weight, colour and smell of those clothes in your closet. They are like the weather, the ocean, changing all the time. And I'll just provide a little anecdote here that um, when we were installing this work of Heidi, uh, this skirt element, which had to be attached, well, was attached to the mannequin, the coat is buttoned on, was a bit too creased as far as Jerry Gorovoy, Louise's studio manager, was concerned. She had died in 2010, this exhibition's in 2012. So we had to bring an ironing board into the gallery and very gently iron the skirt over the ironing board while we are holding the mannequin. And it was a very poignant, disconcerting, intimate experience because these were her clothes. And I had this split-second moment thinking, as we do when we iron, am I going to be able to smell perfume or something more, you know, about her? But, of course, that didn't happen. But it was a marvellous moment of, of great intimacy with her works. And Femme Maison, the hybrid form of Femme Maison, has a long history of configuration in Louise's oeuvre. In various media and degrees of abstraction, appearing initially in a series of drawings and paintings made between 1945 and 1947, the woman house. But in this beautiful late work, the textured fabric affirms the central relationship of woman with the domestic sphere and it's cut from a cardigan. And its coloration and fragmentation points to Louise's abiding interests in the beauty of classical antiquity and archaic images of woman, thinking of the Venus of Willensdorf, for instance. And just a few more examples of re a reiteration of forms, suspended hanging forms, alternatively in a position of repose and silence or perhaps torture and torment. And then the, the tall um, graduated figures are padded and, uh, and designed with uh, mattress ticking, blankets, uh, cardigans and jumpers, but they come right out of a 19, very important group of works between 1945 and 1957 called The Personage, which were totemic works uh, that reflected Louise's personal relationships and represented <coughs> particular people in her life. So she continued these, but they have a rather formal, uh, modernist, serial nature to them. Images of sex and sexuality, coupling, human relationships, the intensity of human relationships she did not shy away from in her late works. This is a work made in her early 90s. And then the fabric sculpture that gave such three-dimensional reality uh, to her inner life uh, found its counterpoint uh, in fabric drawings composed from cut fragments of her dresses, among other textiles. And this is a suite called The Waking Hours, which is absolutely beautiful from a series of blue patterned dresses and silk chemises or sh other shirts. Um, Louise, in her early sewn works, would do the sewing herself. And, you could, and, and for those of us, uh, uh, the curators amongst us who need to know whether she made it or someone else made it, the rough hewn stitching in the early fabric works is her. But there's a moment in her early 90s where she decides that she really can't do the kind of piecework that she wants to achieve the particular effects of the drawings of The Waking Hours or indeed works like this, a suite, three works from a suite called The Dawn. So for 10 years she worked alongside this marvellous seamstress called Mercedes. And Mercedes would come to the studio every day and she, Louise would select the fabrics, determine the shapes and Mercedes would do the piecework uh, and so hand sew um, these particular forms. Dana Harris is a Melbourne-based artist, uh, and her practice is project-based, but most recently focused on her obsession with mapping. And she creates small drawings, weavings, and large-scale site-specific installations. 
utilising a variety of techniques and media uh, that investigate connections between the natural and urban environments. Her practice is marvellously exploratory and experimental. Um, it's, it's full of intent, um, as we see in these uh, terrific um, earlier loom drawings, uh, but in its intent it remains very open-ended. So I've got a selection of uh, earlier and recent works by Dana uh, to reflect on her manipulation of textiles um, in a contemporary format. Dana studied Ikebana in the early 1990s in Tokyo, that you know, exacting uh, Japanese art of flower arranging, uh, and she pu pursued these particular studies at the famous Sagetsu School, the most avant-garde and the most important in Japan. And she honed her particular aesthetic sense of architectural form uh, and the discipline of arrangement, where plays of light and shadow and texture uh, and the armature that supports particular forms um, and the overall design of those forms in space um, are determined within quite strict uh, aesthetic and material boundaries. So while Dana's work is highly exploratory, she limits herself to a particular colour, a particular format in some of the ways she approaches her sculptural objects or her installations. These wire works particularly were informed by her studies in Ikebana uh, and the classical <coughs> ideals of balance and restraint are imperative to Ikebana as they are to the way in which Dana decides when a particular loom drawing, loom drawing or one of her wire works is or was finished. In her work there's a really marvellously beautiful balance between Eastern aesthetics, particularly Japanese aesthetics, and Western models of modernist art and architecture. And it's a, an art of, again, quite poignant um, and surprising intimacy, both in scale, as we see with these smaller works, and even in some of her large-scale installations. The home project was the moment I first really encountered Dana's work. These large stretched linen canvases, um, the full work on the left, Sandringham, and the detail of Sandringham on the right, and they were quite simply um, floor plans of the homes that she lived in, knitted. She was thinking about the spaces. She'd, she'd been in a number of different houses over the course of her life, either singly or with her partner. And while she was living in them and thinking about specific relationships, she decided that she would think about mapping them because she was looking for a place to live. She was recalling the rooms in the house, trying to draw it, and as with all artists, work begets work, idea begets idea, and she began to knit them. And she said that she was dreaming and thinking about the life she'd led. And she'd also had houses that she'd kept, in which she'd kept very few photographs of the spaces. In some houses, she'd kept no images of the houses in which she'd lived. So memories came flooding in of the rooms, of the people, of the times. And so she began to construct them and then attach them outwards um, to the backs of these stretched linen canvases. But those tendrils, those, those thin single strands of wool metaphorically operate as pathways to somewhere else beyond the confines of the canvas. So each room was knitted in wool, cotton or silk, then individually sewn, each room rather, <laughs> cotton, wool or silk, and then individually sewn together it's a very organic process, and this is just one from a number of them. She's got a great website. Uh, and the overall scale of the perimeter is only seen once all the rooms are sewn together. And they were quite, not necessarily to scale, but faithful renditions of the number of rooms in a particular house. And here's one with Gregory Street. In 2009, I had an opportunity to consider her work in greater depth, uh, and this is a work called Location, which was included in the 2009 Yearings Station Sculpture and Exhibition and Awards. And it was a work that was six metres in length, uh, woven, uh, hand-knitted rather, using fine cotton rope, and installed on the historic barn at Yearings Station, stretched and attached onto the landscape. 
and it surveyed the pathways of the site, and there are many paths at Ewing Station for those of you who haven't been there, uh, relating to the historical location map that is used to guide people around. The work won the award in the end, and I was joined by Geraldine Barlow, the Curatorial Manager of International Art at the Queensland Art Gallery, and Anthony, Anthony McEnany from RMIT, who is leading public art uh, studies there. And we were completely convinced by the way in which this work articulated Dana's preoccupation with mapping spatial relationships, not just of Yearing Station itself, but the way in which a work of this kind, and it's important to see the picture of her installing it, maps the relationships of the body to scale, sight, and us as viewers. Um, it was a really very compelling work that kept us looking again and again and again, and a, a really marvellous uh, uh, exemplar of site specificity. In more recent works, um, and it's interesting to have been able to include these given what Louise Bourgeois did with the raw material of the seamstresses and, and the weavers. Um, these are more sculptural, um, manipulated, uh, somewhat anthropological forms in which uh, the spool is bound with a series of colours and textures and, and manipulations of the thread uh, across the surface and shape of the invented spool in some instances. Um, as part of a project called the Wangaratta Project that I had the pleasure of opening uh, a few years ago. And just a few details of the very time-consuming, beautiful approach to the sculptural body of the spools and the way in which they have been lovingly um, produced uh, by wrapping uh, various colours in a, in a series of, again, Ikebana-like or origami, more Ikebana, um, treatment of um, texture, surface, and or spatial organisation. Sorry, Jason, can you tell us the size of them? Well, they're the size of... They are, excuse They're this. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. They're, they're, they are to scale, yeah. And the Wangaratta project also included uh, a terrific, uh, again, decidedly conceptual work, um, string work, and string work included uh, an installation of nails, short nails for the major roadways of Wangaratta and larger nails for other towns like Everton, Oxley, Millowa, Glen Rowan, Whitfield. And she would establish lines of sight and travel and journeying from those townships to other parts of the landscape as she experienced it in a residency program. So there's a particular poetics to Dana's work. If we look at something like the spool works, there's a very direct reference to the work of the weaver, the sewer. Uh, but then using that raw material for an exercise in mapping location and thinking through her sense of place. Uh, so she's a, she's a fascinating artist. Fiona Hall while dazzlingly successful, um, is also one of the most influential and critically acclaimed artists working today. She's been exhibiting since 1974, uh, achieving early recognition as a photographer, but since 1990 uh, and the production of the first series of sardine cans that we probably all know and for which she became widely known, her, she has worked almost ex exclusively in sculpture and installation, transforming commonplace materials into alluring but politically charged objects. And here we have a detail and the full image of a work called Understory, private collection in Sydney, uh, in which um, she, over a course of about a decade, produced several vitrine, museum-style vitrine works of woven glass beads. Glass beads is a classic trading item in colonial histories. Uh, but this is also where she began in this work, or this is the work in which she introduced uh, camouflage. Uh, camouflage comes from nature, appropriated by the military, as we'll see 
her further renditions of it in just a few moments, uh, but um, it was a way in which she was able to articulate um, some of the political charge of um, camouflage. Fiona's lifelong passion for the natural environment underpins her practice of integrally connecting concept with material. So here we see Tender, uh, her faithful rendition of more than 80 birds' nests woven over a period of five years in museums around the world um, from shredded legal tender $1 American bills. Uh, and they, they are exceptional renditions of nests. The work is called Tender, as in the tenderness of the nest and legal tender. And when I asked her about the books in which she was faithfully transcribing every single serial number of the dollar bills so that she could record them, I said, just how many serial numbers do you have? And she said, because she had to buy the legal tender to shred it. And she said, I've got 180,000 um, serial numbers. So this belongs to the Queensland Art Gallery and it's just a tale of the investment that artists make in their work, and it's a particularly powerful statement um, that extends her environmental concerns. But it's where we see a great example of material marrying concept, marrying with concept. And her work consistently articulates tensions around three intersecting concerns, global politics, economics, and the environment. And she sees each of these as a failed state, as, as she says, a minefield of madness, badness and sadness, stretching beyond the foreseeable future. She is deft in turning her hand to many different materials, but this is one of three carpets that she has made over the last decade. <coughs> and I want to concentrate on the work on the right, Maya. Um, because the carpets themselves are visually opulent, and in the case of Maya, its visual opulence and loaded content actually recalls the aesthetic program of someone like William Morris, but that's where the romance ends. Maya itself refers to the draining of the southern marshlands of Iraq by Saddam Hussein as punishment for the marsh Arabs' support of the Shiite uprising against Hussein's forces after the first Gulf War in 1991. And the draining of the marshlands destroyed a pristine wetland ecosystem and forced the majority of the inhabitants to flee. The background pattern for Maya reproduces the three-coloured desert pattern that is the US military's camouflage worn in Iraq. And for Hall, the use of the pattern underscores the military's presence in Iraq as both the background to and catalyst for appalling environmental degradation caused by both the first Gulf War and subsequent conflicts. She doesn't just blame the Americans, but this is the beginning of her deep research and use of uh, camouflage and textiles. Meyer also depicts 14 plant species found in the Iraqi marshlands along with their local names in Arabic script. You can see around the borders and images of the water snake and frog, which remind us, as she does in so much of her work, that landscapes are sites of cohabitation and that the colonisation by one always results in the marginalisation of the other. So her work is deeply complex and, of course, clearing um, is a little more self-evident um, in the disappearance of birds from particular landscapes. Her work has become darker and bleaker um, in recent years and was particularly dark and bleak in the Venice Biennale last year. And works like the Siberian Tiger morphed into other uses of camouflage, um, like Portrait of the Victor with the Sri Lankan military shirt. But if we look at the Siberian Tiger and then just quickly go to, excuse me, the Night Parrot and the Axolotl from a suite called Fall Prey, Fall prey was a suite in which she continually she had to hunt down these textiles because she wanted the camo, she wanted camouflage that had been worn. She didn't want to just go to a disposal store and buy a new camouflage. The presence of the body in it, the use of it, was very important to her. And these works are a statement in which Fiona talks about the pitting of the natural world against our cultural manipulations of it. 
and she configured a number of these animals, a menagerie of them, and draw them, drew them from the critically endangered species list of the International Conservation Union's red list. She constructed them in military camouflage, but as we can see, she embellished them with recycled items from contemporary culture, and they were everything from watches, mobile phones, dice, um, billiard balls, as we can see in the Siberian tiger, um, the dice in the uh, teeth of the portrait of the victor, a roll of the dice. So there are many symbols and metaphors used in these works. And another alternative reflection on natural history we can find in the work of Louise Saxton, who is also a Melbourne-based artist. And for the past 15 years, her work has centred on reconstructing the detritus from the home, including collections of everyday business envelopes and vintage walls, pa wallpapers, discarded needlework, book illustrations and domestic porcelain. But since the mid to late 2000s, her practice has engaged primarily with, reconstru with, with the reconstruction of needlework. And the images I'm going to show primarily are from an exhibition uh, with which we worked, in which we worked with Louise at Heidi in 2012 called Sanctuary. It's part of our Contemporary Projects program. Louise's reclamation and recollection pays homage to art historical ancestors and anonymous domestic needle workers. The homage finds form in alluring, politically charged and sometimes melancholic renditions of birds and insects that define Louise's converging interests in nature, loss, the home, and the intersecting visual and craft cultures and pictorial traditions of which she's a part. The works in Sanctuary were made from the textiles of bygone eras, doilies, tablecloths, and bed linen, gleaned on regular visits to opportunity shops and second-hand markets or donated to, to Louise by friends and family. She was attuned to the fact that these painstakingly produced domestic objects had become part of our throwaway culture, and she has said that, while discarded by others, for me, these particular domestic needlework forms have come to represent a silent collaboration between myself as the one who salvages and reconstructs, the original historical artists, some of whom are largely unknown or forgotten, and countless anonymous needleworkers. So I just want to quickly run through, just to, to detail what Louise did, and in fact, um, <laughs> Rather humorously, she suggested that some people regarded her as a cultural vandal because she would dismantle these lovingly produced doilies, tablecloths and domestic needlework examples to, to uh, elicit the particular form like, you know, the bottle brush or a leaf or a, another floral emblem. Uh, painstakingly colour code them in the studio and then use bridal tool and source material drawn from historical renditions um, of um, bird species painted by 18th and 19th century um, natural um, specimen artists or natural history artists. So for instance, here on the left, um, we have the marvellous Queen Billy um, from 2010, a King Parrot, the green work, illustrated by British colonial artist Sarah Stone, who lived between 1760 and 1844, who painted hundreds of birds and other specimens um, uh, as part of a natural history project. And in fact, many of the specimens that Louise uh, sourced and used from library collections, museum collections, books, etc., um, seeking the original works if she could find them, uh, were here in Australia, often done by women some women who'd been forgotten whose, or whose histories were unknown uh, and allied to the anon anonymity of the domestic needle workers whose work she was reclaiming and reusing in these new forms. Uh, but the magic of them is that each element is pinned to the tool, to bridal tool, and the pinning was conceptually central to the final work because it could it was on the brink always of collapse and loss in reclaiming and reusing but gently pinning there was a tentativeness there was a there was a tenuousness uh, it was impermanent um, so here again we have this marvelous um, 
ally of <coughs> conceptual intent with material, reclamation, uh, a recasting of the forms in wonderful new renditions that speak about many things, women, the history of women in the history of art, the uh, honouring anonymous domestic needle workers and looking at the way in which species have been um, drawn, retained and historically recorded over time. So they're quite marvellous reclamations and they are painstaking um, and for instance a work like the um, I can't remember what that bird's called and I was so busy this morning I forgot to put the title on it but um, they can take up to 5,000 pins um, so they were really quite a marvellous uh, opportunity to, um, and they need to be seen in reality because the pins under lights have a, fl have a sheen, so they, they contribute to the sculptural form of the work. Um, but materially and conceptually, they're exceptionally rich. Um, and in recent years, in 2013, this wonderful heart garden, uh, which now uh, is in the possession of the St Vincent's Hospital, again, as you can see, made up from so many disparate elements. And in 2013 also, um, this um, beautifully poetic work called Let the Jungle In, which was the winner of the 2013 Yearing Station Sculpture Award, uh, a 1.5 metre high circular bamboo bird's cage, from which a heart, an anatomically shaped heart shape was cut out as if to release, to open the cage and let the jungle in, uh, took its title from Rudyard Kipling's tale of the jungle's revenge on civilization. And so applying reclaimed needlework to the exterior of the cage and sometimes to the interior and to parts of the released open heart shape, there was this marvelous transformation of the cage into nest and from the prison into a kind of sanctuary or home. So these prevailing themes um, throughout Louise Saxton's work. And of course, men. Needlework, textiles is not the province of women. Um, men have been making textiles for thousands of years, sailors and tailors. Um, and I've got just two to talk about because I can see that I'm running out of time. Um, David McDermott, who lived between 1952 and 1995, and who is the subject of several important re-evaluations, was an artist, designer and political activist, recognised for his prominent and sustained artistic engagement <laughs> in issues relating to gay male identity. And he became very famous for a number of political active, act, politically active um, activities and, uh, and projects. Um, very famous for a series of what we call rainbow aphorisms, the most famous of which is probably I want a future that lives up to my past, but this is the one that I have on my door at my office at work. <laughs> which some new staff members thought was a little hardcore. <laughs> I did put a smiley face at the bottom of the printout. Um, but it's part of, it, it gives you a sense of just how acerbic and wonderful David was. In 1973, David met the jeweller Peter Tully, very well represented in many public collections, and they moved to Sydney, where they joined their friend and creative collaborator, Linda Jackson. There's David and Linda at the top. And they very quickly soon began collaborating with fashion designer and retailer Clarence Chai and the Sydney-based designer and retailer Jenny Key. And we see Linda Jackson, Peter Tully and Jenny Key in the bottom photograph. After their move to Sydney, after David's move to Sydney with Peter Tully, uh, he was soon involved in Jenny Key's fashion business, Flamingo Park in the Strand Arcade, famous fashion house, hand painting fabrics for Linda Jackson's dresses and a whole lot of garments. David was an amazing graphic and textile designer. In June 1970, and this is a marvellous work from the Heidi Collection in which he is drawing on the history of quilting, assemblage, applique, uh, in a completely contemporary uh, work from around 1981. In June 1979, at the age of 27, David went to New York, and the move to New York coincided with the establishment of a wildly popular black and Hispanic underground dance club called Paradise Garage, of which David was an early devotee. 
and Paradise Garage also served as an inspiration for a suite of work to which McDermott gave the title Disco Quilts, produced between 1979 and 1981, in what was then the radically new material of reflective holographic mylar sheeting. Uh, he was an incredible manipulator of all kinds of materials, but he said that his interest in popular culture and popular culture materials was one thing, but his work was an intersection between folk art, women's art, needlepoint, patchwork, quilts, and contemporary materiality, using loud, cheap, vulgar plastics to make pretty pictures, as we see here in this disco quilt. But throughout the time in New York, he continued to supply painted fabrics to Linda Jackson. And in the bottom photograph, we see David standing in front of one of his most famous painted bed sheets or lengths of cotton, wearing rainbow clothes by Linda. He would send her drawings of what he wanted her to make and they would, it was a marvelously productive collaboration. And this precipitated a very important first exhibition for David and a group of artists called the Art Clothes Exhibition at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in 1980 and 1981, which also included new works by Linda and Jenny, just at the point that Jenny Key particularly uh, was becoming that incredible force in Australian fashion that she was for the better part of the 1980s. Uh, and David and Linda are the subject of a new show at the Wollongong Art Gallery, which opens on Saturday. Um, uh, called Hand on Heart Shall Never Part, and it's the fashion collaboration between the two of them, which is going to be a remarkable survey. It's the second part of the marvellous David McDermott survey mounted by the NGV a couple of years ago called When This You See, Remember Me. And just another close-up and a rendition of the way in which the painted sheets would then be transformed by Linda uh, into garments. And David did a whole lot of other allied textile work in relation to weaving leather, chains, a whole range of things. But it was really his fashion collaboration, his textile collaboration with Linda. Uh, he would send her swatches of fabric uh, painted with particular fabric paints, which gave her a completely new licence, particularly silks and organzas uh, in the 1980s. Uh, so her fashion career, she acknowledges, um, owes an enormous amount uh, to David, it wasn't all wattle uh, and koalas <laughs> and opals. <coughs> and just a shot of classic examples um, of their collaboration uh, from the NGV show. And finally, another young man, someone who's very much worth looking at and following, is the marvellous Paul Yore, um, who is one of a, a, a younger generation of artists, and there are half a dozen young men Alistair McClucky, Paul, um, uh, uh, Lucas Grogan. There are, there are a lot of young guys who are exploring the history of textiles and, and you know, challenging uh, the uh, prescription of certain modes of practice to women only. Um, so, but Paul, over re in recent years, um, has had what he called slow beginnings in needlepoint. Um, that he has taught himself rather slowly and rather randomly, uh, but that have helped him overcome a personal crisis. And uh, he regards, and this is, I kept it pretty tame. Um, for those of you who know Paul Yore's work, uh, they can be marvellously, wonderfully uh, hardcore, that's the only way to put it. Um, boys go crazy, that, or boys go wild, you know, use your imagination. Um, but stitching, sewing things, weaving, using fibres, um, he's been quite conscious of honouring what he regards as ancient processes. He believes there's something of a subversive element in choosing to work in and with slow, laborious methodologies of image making and object making in a digital age where everything, ex everything is expected to happen now. And in a conversation, he said to me that the words textile and text share a common etymology, the Latin texere, to weave. And this idea for him has been hugely important, like a piece of writing, a cloth is woven together. And increasingly, he said, this coincidence has formed part of the conceptual rationale for employing this very labour-intensive mode of production that he's undertaken with many different weavings. 
They are pieced together from many thousands of fragmentary pieces into a single unified form. He says this DIY constructedness, because they happen quite organically, is central to an understanding of his work. It's temporal, it's embedded in the love of hours and time on the couch, it's painful, purgative, and deeply emotional. But he says that while the colour, the subject matter, as biographical uh, and as challenging as it sometimes can be, um, owes much more to classical aesthetics than it does to contem contemporary politics and conventions. Uh, in conversation, he says that he's researched medieval tapestry quite, production quite intensively and the manner in which figures are woven to sit within the picture plane of tapestries. So there's this wonderful acknowledgement of the history and the discipline of which he is a part um, with these new um, works, which are highly detailed and, and lovingly produced. As well as hand-woven needle points, many of the textiles he cuts up and appliques are found or recycled, again, old bed sheets, doona covers or clothing. And so they also have some relationship with the domestic fear and again, as so many of these artists have had, with the body. So with just six artists <coughs> across cultures, across ages, across generations, with different lives, uh, for me, it's been a quite wonderful meditation on the way in which textiles, their manipulation through very traditional means, through avant-garde means, through sculpture, through traditional tapestry, through the mining of the closet to the use of ersatz, uh, everyday materials. Artists will always remind us of the warmth, the humanity, and the deeply personal connection we all have to fabric. Thank you. Thank you.